I want to read uh, the whole Psalms, but I want to say before I get to reading it, uh, 36 or whatever it is, years of ministry, I can tell you probably on both hands what I would consider to be special messages that God has given me. This morning's message is one of those. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to preach a message today entitled The Wounder. And God has spoken to my life, and I'm not going to tell you that I'm there, that I have put in practice all that he has taught me and is teaching me, but I'm going to tell you this. I've gotten hold of an amazing biblical truth that is a life changer. And I just pray that the Holy Ghost of God will help you today in, in this message today entitled The Wounder. Now, when you get to Psalms 42, let's look at it. Let's read down through there. As the heart panteth. Now, I want you to see the word picture that God is giving here. As the heart. Now, a heart is a, a deer type of an animal, all right? It's a deer kind of an animal. You, you and I might call it a deer. Panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone to, by the way, that will keep you out of a psychiatrist's office right there. Pour your soul out to God. That will keep you out of a shrink. Save you a lot of money, by the way. For I had gone to the multitude. I, I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. But then he says something. He said, I went to church. I went to worship. But he said, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. That means you're getting in the face of God. You're getting in the presence of God when you're getting hope from his countenance. Oh, God, verse 6, that my soul is cast down within me. Have you ever been there? You ever been there? Therefore, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan from the hill of the, from, uh, and of Hermonites and from the hill of Miser. Now, watch him. He's again drawing word pictures here. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise. And notice something. Thy water spouts and all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. He said, life is just getting like me out in the middle of a stormy ocean. And he said, I'm trying to keep my head above water. I'm trying to stay going. But it just, here comes another wave. And here comes another wave. And here comes another wave. And I just don't know whether I'm going to make it or not. That's the word picture he's drawing out. Yet the Lord, watch, watch his faith now, come in. Watch, watch him reach down in his soul in the faith. Yet the Lord will recommend his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night, his song shall be with me. My, that's why you need a song book at your house. You need your Bible and a song book and a good concordance. You, you live with those, amen. Did you know that your preacher has been times when I didn't get, wasn't getting anything out of the Bible? It just seemed like it was just, you know, it wasn't. And I reach over and get my song book and just start going through it. Just not sing them, just read them. Man, oh man, you talk about getting a blessing. Just take your songbook someday. But anyway, my prayer in the God of my life. Verse 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Do you ever feel like that? Lord, have you forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Watch verse number 10 now. I'm preaching on the wounder. As with a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Verse 11, again, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Brother Larry Brown would say you need to have a talk with yourself, and David's having a talk with himself. He's saying, why, are, why am I cast down? And why art thou disquieted within me? And then he says this, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now, chapter 42 of the book of Psalms tells you what to do when you've been hurt and you've been wounded. Chapter 41 is going to tell you explicitly how David got wounded. It's in chapter 42 he's dealing with his wound, his hurts, but he really tells us in chapter 41 what it is. Look, look in verse number 7. 
All that hate me whisper together against me. Against me do they devise my what? My hurt. Where's the wound? Verse number 8. An evil disease, say they, cleaveth fast unto him. And now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. Watch verse number 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, there's layers of truth in here. There's the practical part of it that Ahithophel, his counselor, turned against him in the middle of Absalom's rebellion. And those men whom he had went to church with turned against him and actually wanted to kill, have him killed and destroyed. And he was dealing with here betrayal. That's what he was dealing with. Everybody, and, and you say, well, Reggie kind of brought it on himself. Yeah, we're going to get that. But he's dealing with, by the way, heal there is also the prophetic. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible talks about he'll bruise the heel and, and the head, okay? David is a picture of foreshadow of Christ. But 41 t tells you what to do when you get hurt. Now, I don't know uh, how you may in your life have experienced certain wounds and hurt. You say, Reggie, I've never been hurt. Just keep living a while. You'll get there. Especially keep serving the Lord. Keep trying to serve God. You'll get hurt. You'll get wounded. And, uh, but David tells us in 41 what it is he's hurt about. Then in 42, he's telling us how to, how to deal with as a wounded person, as a hurt man. A 16-year-old boy from Essex, Missouri, by the name of Walter Dixon, in evidently lied to the U.S. Hello, Brother Paul. Good to see you, sir, my brother. Walter Dixon, 16 years old from Essex, Missouri, southeast Missouri, 16 years old, evidently lied and got into the Army in World War II, late at the end of World War II. And he got out of World War II, and he was fine, and, but he wanted to make a career out of the Army, so he stayed in the Army and so forth and, and, and all that. But anyway, uh, in 1950, he met a young lady, fell in love with her. They got married. Oh, my, he was happily married with this beautiful young lady. But not long after they were married, Walter Dixon was called to go to Korea, to the Korean War. And while Walter Dixon was over there, uh, one day he walked up to a group of fellow soldiers, and right as he walked up to the group of fellow soldiers, a bomb came in, and that bomb literally blew many of those men's bodies apart. Walter Dixon survived the bomb, but in the course of it, he took his coat off, and one of his buddies' his bodies was so tore up, dead, that it bothered him. He took his coat, and he wrapped it around his buddy's body, took his army jacket off and wrapped it. But inside that coat was letters from his wife back over here in the United States. Walter continued to fight the Koreans, the North Koreans, but he was captured, became a prisoner of war. And for 28 months, he was a prisoner of war in North Korea. Somehow or another, the U.S. Army was able to get a hold of the bodies of these men that were killed, and when they got a hold of this buddy's body that he cut his coat around, somehow or another, there was a mix-up. And Walter's mother and father and his wife over here in America got letters from Harry, signed by Harry Truman to sadly inform them that their loved one was uh, killed in action. And for 28 months, actually uh, it was, uh, I believe, 842 days, Walter was a prisoner of war in some of the meanest conditions you can imagine. He was treated like an animal caged like an animal, nearly starved to death, living on the hope that the Americans would eventually win the war or get him out of there. After 842 days, on September the 5th, 1953, Walter Dixon from southeast Missouri was released in a prisoner of war exchange and released and allowed to go back home. He'd been through a lot of wounding. Saw his buddies killed, blown to pieces, put in a prisoner of war camp, starved, beat, spit upon. I will just tell you the truth. Many of those prisoners were made to eat their own excretions. They were tortured, made to do and endure things that you and I would call unspeakable atrocities today. I don't know all of the individual things that happened to Walter, but he went through a lot of, lot of rot. Stuff that most of them won't even tell you or talk to you about. Walter came back excited to see his mother and dad and his wife. 
But he got home back to America. And when he came up to the door, we found where his wife was at. He found out that his wife had remarried and had a child by the man she had remarried already. How would you like to live 28 months in a prison or war camp hanging on to the dream that you'd see your wife? She said, they said you were dead. What was I supposed to do? Walter turned around, walked away. And um, I ask you this question, was Walter hurt? You think life give him some wounds? Yeah. And I'll tell you the rest of the story at the conclusion of the message today. David was writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost from a wounded, hurting heart, specifically betrayal of people that he loved and had fellowship with. This dear, this heart the Bible speaks of is a picture of you and I when we're wounded, what we're to do. God has not left you without instructions what to do when you get hurt and wounded. And God knows you're going to be wounded and he knows you're going to be hurt and he has given you explicit, explicit instructions what to do. God says, like the heart, like the deer, when it's wounded, I want you to go to the brook. How many guess what the brook is? Amen. It's the water of life. Jesus talked about this brook. He said it'll be a well of water springing up within you. The water of the word. He said to wash with the water of the word. Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. When you get wounded, God is telling you and I, he says, I want you to go to the Bible. I want you to go to Christ, the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word, Jesus Christ. And the written word. And I want you to go to that brook. And I want you to get healing and help when you're wounded and when you're hurt. Brooks are streams that are at the lowest part of the valley. It's a place to go when you're the lowest. God already has a place for you prepared ahead of time for your lowest points of your life. Are you listening to me? Before you ever need it, God has already prepared a brook and the water for you and the place to go for you before you ever need it, before you're ever going to be wounded. He just wants you to know this morning that when you get hurt, no matter how you're hurt, no matter who hurts you, no matter what situation it is, he wants you to go to this brook. Go to your Bible. Now, I'm going to say something this morning. I had no intention to say when I'm preaching, but I'm, I'm going to say it because I want to give honor to whom I want to do, and I want to do it while you're alive. But Brother Marvin Lakey, I so appreciate him. And I'm going to tell you why. That man has been in the book. Amen. And if you will listen to him, it's not because he's anything. It's because he has went to the brook. And he has spiritual sustenance within his heart. He has water to draw upon. And I would encourage everybody in this church to look to these older people who have learned that their hope is in the word of God and their strength and their steadfastness and their faithfulness and their ability to endure the hardships of life are in this brook. This pure, sweet water that God has given us in the lowest places of our life. God is telling us that there will be times in our lives like this heart, that there will be circumstances and experiences that will both draw you to the brook, but sometimes it will drive you to the brook. There are some things that, watch this, that will draw you, you'll want to go yourself, and then other times there's things that are driving you to the brook. But it's in these valleys of the brook that are often, uh, if you go down, especially if you get in the mountainous area, brooks are often places of, of brush. There's a lot of brush around a lot of brooks. There's a lot of steep places, a lot of rough places. It's places, a, a canyon sometimes, and crags and rocks and places to hide. Now I'm going to give you some reasons that a heart or a deer would be drawn or driven to the brook. One of the first reasons that, become, and I'll use, I'm just going to use alliteration here, wasted. There is what we call, even in this area of the country, wasting disease. Uh, Brother Shane might help me some with this, but I have had just a little bit of experience. But a deer that dies of wasting disease, does anybody know where you'll find them? By the water. And I say that to say this, maybe when you're sick and you don't know why you're sick. I mean, just here recently, I have been dealing with situations where 
a, a mother who has a child that's in horrible condition and needs almost 27, 24-7 care. She was diagnosed with cancer, uh, breast cancer and, and female cancer, and, and she's just been through one surgery. Now she's, after Christmas, she's going to be going through a total a surgery situation, and she's going through that, that time, and, but I can tell you something, it's driving her to the brook. And sometimes sickness will drive you to the brook. Sometimes wind will drive you to the brook when storms of life, wind and weather. Uh, a deer oftentimes, actually I know this to be a fact, a deer a lot of times if, when it gets that wind gets blown, they'll go find. I, I know two or three places on my farm that when a real good wind, I mean it gets bad wind, come little deer, they'll go down in there and they'll, they'll just get down in there out of the wind. Just, if you go down in there, it's just like everything's up above. And they'll go to that low place. But also the heart will go to the brook when he's weary and he's worn and he's weak. As I said the other day, my wife watched a deer come out the other day across our field and a coyote was right in behind it. Coyotes will do what they call pad a deer. Does anybody know what that is, patting a deer? It just means that he's not going to try to catch it. He's just going to stay behind it till he wears it down. That's what coyotes will do. And by the way, that's what the devil will do with you. He'll just pad you. He's not trying to get you just in one deal. He's just going to keep after you and keep after you. You're just tired, wore out. And they'll even switch off. One coyote will pick up where the other coyote left off, and they'll just keep patting that deer. Satan will pad you, just pad you, just wear, wear you down. And, but a deer will go there, and, uh, and there's one reason they know that. There's, and again, it's a good place to hide, but it's a good place to lose the track. Now listen to this. How many knows how a deer or even a, a fox will elude the predator in a brook? He goes into the brook, and then he walks through the brook. Oh, whoo, you talk about good stuff. And they'll lose his trail. And here comes that coyote, or here comes that animal, that predator down to the brook where that old weary deer's at, and the deer just starts walking up through the brook in the water. He's going to lose the trail. He may go up there a quarter mile and jump out, try to jump 15 or 20 feet, and that, that thing spend half the day trying to pick up his trail again. What's the message to that? When you get weary and you get worn, and you're tired, and you've been patted by the devil, go down to the brook and just walk in the brook. Amen? Don't go down there and just get you a nip. Just get in the middle of the brook and say, Lord, I'm going to stay in the word till the devil loses my trail. And then sometimes, as I said, where the, that he goes when, to the brook when he's worried. And you say, what do you mean worried? Reggie, deer get worried? Well, they get, yeah, they do. They get gnats and flies, and they're buzzing them. And do you know what a deer will do sometimes? An animal will do? Go right out. They'll go right out in that water. They're hot. They're, you know, the heat's on. The butt flies are buzzing. And they go out in that water and just get in that water and get deep as they can. And get rid of them flies. Get rid of the worry and get rid of the junk. What I'm saying to you, every situation that comes to your life is go to the brook. And then he can go to the brook to win. And you can too. As I said, he'll lose the trail of the predator. But you and I, as pictured as this heart, God wants you not you to see yourself and me to see myself as this deer, this heart. We're to go there for water. Surely a, a heart goes to the brook for water. And God wants you and I to go to the brook. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But we need to go to the brook for worship, and we need to go to the brook for wisdom. David could envision himself. David was a shepherd. David is out there where it's at. I'll tell you what, raise your kids in the country if you can. Get them out there where they can get their feet dirty and some cow manure. Amen. I'll tell you something. Where they, where they can see where God, what God's doing. David could envision himself as this heart panting. He said, Lord, I'm like a deer panting after you, Lord. I'm thirsty. God, I need you. But one of the main reasons, now listen to me, that a heart will go to the brook is because he's wounded. This country is full of wounded people. Churches all across the country full of wounded, hurting people. When a deer is wounded, it will go to the brook because that, and, and there's a difference here. That brook, especially a clean, flowing brook, will cause its blood of the wound to coagulate and heal. It brings healing to him. And you say, Reggie, what's the lesson? When you and I get wounded, we are to go to the brook. David was wounded. He was hurt. 
Now listen to me. I'm going to get into this, and I hope the Holy Ghost will help us all to see this. One of the things that had wounded David was sin. And I'm going to tell you the honest truth about it is, a lot of our wounding in our life is because of our own sin. David had wounded himself. He had swung the axe and hit his own foot. And a lot of times, God, because of our sin, chastens us. Another thing that he was wounded by was uh, sickness or death. You know, the baby died and children dying. And he was being wounded by all these things that has happened. Death can wound us. Sickness can wound us. Sorrows of life can wound us. But specifically here in this passage of Scripture, betrayal had wounded him. Loss of friends and family had had, had, uh, wounded him. David was deeply hurt that Absalom had turned against him. He was deeply hurt. If you ever want to see a picture of a wounded man, see him up there in that passage of Scripture where he's saying, Oh, my son Absalom. Oh, my. You can just hear the groan come out of his soul. Would God I had died for thee. He was wounded also by demonization. Demonization is a very, by the way, people that don't like you and want to hurt you, they demonize you. They have to to make the, to justify what they're doing. They have to make you out to be a sorry. They'll drag up every sin you've ever committed for 30 years past and demonize you. And, and I'm telling you, it hurts to be demonized. Uh, he was maligned. He was hated by people because of Saul's family. A lot of them hated him. David was misunderstood by a lot of people. David had been wounded by jealousy and envy. The Bible is very clear that Saul eyed David and, Je- and Saul was jealous. I'm going to tell you, the Bible said jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Now, you listen to me. You get jealous of somebody, what you're wanting them to be is in the grave. God, the Bible said envy is as, as the rottenness of the bones. Rotten bones are people that's dying. And he was wounded. By the way, can I say to you that you will be wounded by people who are jealous of you and envious of you as much as nearly anything that ever happened to you in your life. He was wounded by those who had no mercy, and he was wounded by chastening. It's there in the wounds of life that I have heard, and I have myself said this statement. Oh, God, why? God, why? Now think about this for just a second. This happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. It's all sort of circumstances and people around you. And yet then we turn our head up and say, God, why? Why are you letting me be wounded? Why are these hurts coming in my life? God, why? Now that, the fact that we do that and that people do that is very informative, very instructional. We know intuitively that God is all powerful. He's all-knowing, and he's also all-present. Those are three basic characteristics of God that is incumbent and is absolute with God. He is all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's all-present. So if God's all-knowing, he knows what's happening. He knows about my wounds. If he's all-present, he's right there. He watched it. He saw it. He's there. If he's all-powerful, he could have stopped it. So why didn't you? Now then we, here's where the devil will get you. After the devil has got you to say, God, why? Did you ever notice people don't never say, Satan, why? I've never never heard anybody in my life say, devil, why? You know why? Because they know he's not all powerful. And by the way, he doesn't want you blaming him. He wants you blaming God. Then, because of all that, we also know God is all present. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. Then we've also know something else that's intuitively about God, that God is good. God is kind. God is loving. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's gracious. So watch this. The deductive thinking is that if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present, and he's good and he's compassionate and he's kind and caring, why didn't he do something? Why did he let it happen? Why does he let me hurt? Why does he let me be wounded? Why do I have to experience it? If I am coming into Liberty Faith Church this morning and I came to worship the God of the Bible who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present, good, kind, and compassionate, 
Why did he let this happen? Why didn't he step in and stop it? And why does he let me endure this? And it seemed like every day of my life. And that's the direction Satan wants us to go. It's amazing to me was somebody how the Holy Ghost of God orchestrates services. Tommy got up here this morning and made us, he quoted a passage of scripture and he said, Our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. And I've lived long I've lived long enough to get wounded. I haven't had near what a lot of people have had, but I've had all I all I would want. If I had my choice and get no more, I'd be happy about it. It's in the wounds of life that we hear that cry, why God, why? And we know that God is good and we think, well, but here's something else. It's in our con- construct of God being all this that our, ang- watch this now, watch this. Our anger and our irritation, our frustration, our vengeance is toward people. Because we know we're not supposed to be mad at God, Right? God is good. What he does is right. So in order to keep ourselves out of that trap, we get mad at people. Is everybody with me? I know I I can't be mad at God because God is all present, all powerful, all knowing. He's a perfect, holy God. He does nothing. Hey, can I tell you something? God has never, ever, or will do anything wrong. So I can't be mad at God about this. I can't be frustrated. I can't be angry. I can't be irritated at God. So what do I do? I'll be mad at you. I'll be upset with you. By the way, it was you that hurt me, right? It wasn't God. It was, I think, best I could tell was people. David even said it. He said, uh, he said, man alive. He said, uh, we did eat, we ate bread together. So, Here comes the question. Who is the wounder? I want to ask you now. You listen to me. I'm not playing games this morning. I want you to get a hold of this because I'm I'm honest with you. I've got the message here, but I ain't got the message here and here. And so I've been praying all week long, last couple of weeks, God, take this from here, take it into here, and then take it out into here in my life. So I'm going to ask you a question today. Who? I want you to think about, what has hurt you in your life? So the, the wounds, the hurts that you've experienced. And who it was that hurt you? Who it was that hurt you? Who was it that wounded you? And now we're going to go to the Bible, and I want to introduce you to the wounder. In the book of Genesis, chapter 32, there's a man by the name of Joseph. No, there's a man by the name of Jacob, I'm sorry. Jacob. Jacob has been 20 years gone with Laban, and he's got his wives and his family, and he's, he's had problems with Laban. Laban actually wounded him, so he's leaving. So he comes down, and the Bible says he comes down. Watch, watch where God takes him to, a brook, a brook by the name of Jabok. Now watch this. Jabok means emptying. Hmm. God takes him from a place and people that's been wounding him down to a brook, by the name of Jabok, which just means emptying. In front of him, he finds out that day that he's got his brother Esau, and he's got 400 soldiers, and he's getting ready to meet him, and he, that's nothing but a bad deal, because the last time he ever talked to him, he said he would kill him. So God has done something to a wounded man by the name of Jacob. He takes him to a brook, a low place, in life, by the way, he talked about low, it's really low, because he'd he get, he get wives, children, everybody gone, and the Bible said, your Bible said, he's there alone. And that's probably where God's wanting to take you. To get you alone in a low place of your life where you empty out everything. And the Bible said this, that there, now, I, I just realistic about my own, the Bible said that that night, there came a man, and he wrestled him. Now, I'm thinking this. I'm just a hillbilly, okay? Don't blame this one. Uh, by the way, could I get somebody to get me, could I get uh, somebody to get me a table, a white table, a, a, a white table? You two boys get that for me and set that up here. I'd appreciate it. Just forgot all about that. So 
So here he is. I, I'm, I imagine Jacob sitting at a little campfire, Kenny. He's got a stick, and he's thinking, Laban there, Esau here, life's been a mess. And he's probably going to kill me and all my family. And he's sitting there in the fire, and all of a sudden, go boom, somebody grabs him. That's what your Bible says. It's some, a man came and wrestled him. Somebody jumped him. Now, if you were Jacob, who would you think it would be? Who would you think it might be? Esau. Esau snuck up on me in the night. He done found out I wasn't with my wife and kids, and he tasted, oh, he's back over brother. And Esau's sneaking up, and he's going to get me. And the Bible said he's wrestling him. And the Bible said they wrestled all night. Oh, how big they were wrestling. And the Bible said it come morning. Th- just set it up there, boys. Uh, I'll tell you what to do. Set it right here. Right, just set it right there. I'll just dance around it here while I'm preaching. And the Bible said this angel. Now watch this. The Bible said that it was an angel of the Lord. Right? Then if you go on down in your Bible and read, guess what Jacob said when it was all over with? He said, I have seen who? God face to face. Woo! But there was something happened that night. That Jake was wrestling, he's wrestling, he's wrestling, he fight, watch this, he finally realizes it is not Esau, it is not some enemy, it is not some person, I am wrestling with God. And he does something, one of the greatest secrets you're ever going to find out in your Bible, he laid a hold of him, wouldn't let him go. And the angel said, God said, let me go, the day, daybreak's coming. And watch this. This is a powerful biblical. This is why we don't think like God thinks at all. I'd have been wanting loose. Jacob embraced him and hung on. And watch this. He said, I will not let you go till you bless me. God said, all right, I'll bless you. Tell me how God blessed him. What did God do to send his blessing? He wounded him. He wounded him. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a biblical, and I'll show you right straight through the Bible, that your wounder and my wounder is not who you think it is. We're just like Jacob. We think probably it's Esau or one of his guys, or we think it's some human being, when all the time the wounder is God. And But the reason it's so hard to grab this is so far away from our conception of who God is and what God is like and how God operates that we don't get it. I'm, I'm 65 years old. I ain't got it yet. But I'm getting it. Never before in all my life did I ever see God as my wounder till this past week. Never in my life did I see, oh, it's always somebody, it's always somebody, it's always somebody. Can I tell you that God will, he is the primary wounder of people. He said, what in the world is he doing that for? Well, Jacob left out of there every step. But the God, Bible said he was blessed. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you willing to let the wounder wound you and let him bless you? Through your wounds. Can I tell you the truth about your life is that some of the greatest blessings you've ever experienced came through your wounding. And I'll maybe get to some of that a little bit later. Um, please pray for me while I'm trying to preach this. But there's a couple of th- Here's the point I want you to get. We say, what was God doing? Why, why, would, why, did God, why did God come in there and grab him? Why did God fight? Why was he fighting God? God wounds you to get rid of our fleshly worldliness and our sins to sanctify us. What's going on? How many through your wounds and your sorrows and troubles of life have gotten closer to God and got more mature? That's how he does it. I I wished I could just say, oh, Lord, I got up this morning. I want to read your word. I'm going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to be a better, and and, and it'll be just that way. It doesn't happen that way. I can read my Bible until I'm blue in the face and say, oh, man, that's a great message, and that's a good truth. But you know what? Usually I have to have some kind of experience in life, and God has to wound me to ever get the thing down to where I realize it. I don't know why. I guess I'm stupid. But here's the thing I want you to get. Number one, I want you to get out of the message. God is the wounder, and we need to embrace him. But we not only need to embrace him, we need to embrace the wound. Jacob didn't go up the road going, I'll tell you what, God did this to me. 
That's what you get for serving God. No, well, the Bible said he's blessed. He's happy man. He's happy. Because it was through the wounding that he changed his whole life. He became not Jacob anymore, but who? Israel. Jacob, that deceiver. What was God wounding him about? Getting that deception out of his life. Getting that double mind out of his life. Getting that stupid rot out of his soul and out of his spirit. Getting garbage out of there that need to be out of there. Uh, anyway, so we need to, number one, recognize who the wounder is. Recognize that we need to embrace the wounder and embrace the wound. That is not easy to do. Lord, I want to thank you that you're the wounder. I want to thank you for the wound. I want to thank you. I want to embrace it. I'm going to, I'm going to grab hold of it because I know there's a blessing coming through this wound. Now I want to ask you, let's get down to it. Who is it that wounded you really? Well, usually it's friends, family, church brethren, child, parent, spouse. There's a guy up in St. Louis. I don't know who his name is. Don't know where he lives, but I hate his guts. No, I don't hate anybody in St. Louis. I don't know. Don't know where he lived. Never did nothing to me. You know where you're going to get wounded at? Where's the Bible say you're going to get wounded at? In the house of your friends. Ain't nobody up St. Louis bothering me this morning, cussing me out, lying on. I don't even. <laughs> it's just the truth. But we're wounded in the house of our friends. But it could be a different way. It could be that God has wounded us through health, a health situation. It could be through a financial difficulty that God has wounded us. It could be through the death of a loved one. It could be through words, accusations, as I said, betrayals, misunderstandings. It could be just by rejection. How many have been wounded by rejection? I think it was, who was it up here talking a week or so ago about they never got picked for a ball team? Oh, who was that? Who? Danny Douglas. He's talking about, did you know what Danny was really saying to you while he stood over here and said that? He was saying, I was wounded because I was rejected. That hurt. If you've never been the last guy in a ball team pick, you don't know. Rejection is very wounding. When somebody rejects you, it hurts. Now I'll give you another one. You say, well, that's just Jacob. Well, let's go to Joseph in Genesis chapter 45. Joseph is the son out of Rachel there, and, and his brothers got, the Bible said they just got to where they hated him. His father made him a coat of many colors. And he was favored. But his brothers hated him. So he goes down. His brother, I won't tell you how much, how much higher Joseph was in his father's estimation than his brothers. He said, them rascals off down there. He said, I need to send you a check on them. Make sure they're doing right. Whoa, what's that telling him? That is telling his brothers that I trust him, but I don't trust you guys. <laughs> Woo. So he sends Joseph down there. What do they do? Here he comes. Let's kill him. Whoa, whoa, one of them steps in and says, don't kill him. Here, here, let's put him in a pit. Oh, that's nice. Rattlesnakes, spiders, snakes. I, felt, I heard about a guy out in Utah here a while back, fell down into a, a mine st- deal, and they looked for him for two days. Three rattlesnakes down in their head to kill in the dark. Stayed alive. They throw Joseph in a pit. That's a real nice trick. You're talking about wounding you. These are your flesh and blood. This is your flesh and blood. The guys you ate breakfast with. They take you and throw you into the pit. So then they get really nice, and they're going to wound you some more. That's not enough. We're going to bring him out of here. We're going to sell you as a stinking slave. So he's put in bonds and things. He's carried off down to Egypt through the sands. He gets down in there, and because they did all this to him, he gets, he gets maligned. He gets bought as a slave. Then he gets lied on, betrayed, put into prison. Your book, your Bible tells you in Psalms, I think, 106, that they put him in stocks and bonds, that he was in stocks. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who was it wounded him? You're right, but wouldn't it be very honest to goodness if you and I were in his situation? Would it be, wouldn't it be very easy to every day you woke up and every night you went to bed to think about your brothers who sold you into slavery? In our perspective, it was his brothers that was wounding him. But you're exactly right because in Genesis 45, after, by the way, and you need to study this out tight because Joseph never reconciled to those guys till they repented. Until they came clean. And when they came clean, immediately he had, and by the way, this is the way God is with you. God will never reveal himself to you until you repent. 
until you come clean about it. He'll never restore that fellowship with you till you come clean. But the second he did, he came out to them and said, I am Joseph, your brother. And they was like, oh, 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 oh. and he said, wait, 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 wait. Now what twice your Bible tells you in Genesis 45, verse 5 and verse 7, it says this. It wasn't you that sent me here. Guess what Joseph said? God sent me here. Twice he tells him that, and he tells him twice because it's such a hard truth to believe. So this question comes now. Joseph, if, how could you have such a good attitude when you're in prison down there? Because God sent me, not my brothers. Joseph, why could you feel, you know, why, why did you live and have a good attitude and a sweet spirit whenever everybody's lying on you, betraying you, hurting you, wounding you? Because God's doing it. He's seen it from a higher perspective. Here's my goal. I want this preacher and I want everybody in this church to start seeing your wounder as God and not the people who've hurt you. And until we get there, we're not going to be where we need to be. There is a freedom here and a joy and a victory that's beyond anything. If I can get to the place, Sister Dolores, where I no longer see people as my wounders, then guess what? I don't have to be mad anymore. I don't have to be angry anymore. What's happened in your life that's hurt you? Please, God this morning wants you and I to understand that he is the wounder. It's not, it's not just there. You not only is Joseph the one who realized, but old Job, man, oh man. Guess what? Here comes, you know the scene, but Job didn't see what you see. So here comes the deal. Oh, all your cattle, all your oxen, all your camel, all your asses, they're all gone. They've been stolen. Then here comes a guy. Your sons and daughters, seven sons, three daughters in the house. They were feasting. They didn't have any time. Big wind came, blowed them up. Your sons and daughters all dead. You know what the Bible says? In all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. And he said this. He did not say those Chaldeans and that bunch over there and that bunch and those people over there and those people that stole my cattle and, again, and, and, and this happened that. He watched what he said. Watch it. Job knew who the wounder was. The Lord hath given, and the Lord hath taken away. In all of this, the Bible said he did not chart. I'm going to show you. There's a big chasm between Job and his wife, because his wife had not understood this truth yet. Because she walked up to Job after, and then the second thing comes, he's got bulls on the top of his head, the sole of his feet, sitting in there scraping the pus off his legs. And she walks up and says, Watch this, curse God and die. She's just like you and I. We think, well, if God's good and God's all powerful and God's all knowing, then he's the one who let this happen. She had, watch this, watch this. She had a, a level of comprehension that God is God and he's supposed to be in charge. And if he is in charge, then he's the one who caused this. And if he's like this, then I'd curse him and die. And that's where, that's where Satan wants to take you and it's where he wants to take me. But don't go there. Because Job lived on a higher plane. I can just nearly, it doesn't say this, but I can just nearly either hear him thinking or saying to his wife, honey, you don't understand. God is the wounder. He simply uses instruments of people. Now I want to say something really clear, and you catch me because there's a balance in this, and I'm working on this. This does not mean that you're, the people that God is working through in your life are innocent. Does not mean that. Watch this. All We know, the world may not, but we know that all things work together for good to them that, are, that love God, number one, and that are called according to his purpose, number two. It does not say that all things are good and that all the people that was in that mess were doing good. 
it says that God is making all these things. God is taking Joseph's brothers and their meanness and their wickedness and their sorry, low down, hateful ways. And God is saying, I am God. I'm bigger than you. And I can even take what you're doing to hurt these people and to wound these people. And I can get glory out of it. And I can get good out of it. And I can work it together for good. That's what God's trying to get you and I to understand that when he allows people to wound us, he has a higher purpose. God clearly, God, Joseph understood this. He said, God sent me down here to save much people alive. Could it be, watch this, could it be that the people who God has allowed to wound you are causing you to come to a level of spiritual growth and maturity and ministry that you would have never been able to have had had not God allowed the wounds to come into your life? You know, isn't it funny that people who's been through it can minister to you, but those who haven't been through it can't, oh, can't you don't even want to hear what they have to say. Isn't that interesting? So the wounder, Job, is the, he said, Job recognized it. So we have jo- Jacob recognizing it. Joseph recognized it. Job recognized who the wounder truly is. Fact of it is, when you get in the book of Job, in 5.18 it says, what's this? That God corrects, God chastens, and God wounds. Your Bible tells you. Job 9, 17 says, watch this. This is what Job said. God (laughs) breaketh me with the tempest and multiplieth my wounds, watch what he said, without cause. Hmm. Do you know what that means? Joseph had not done anything to deserve what he got. It wasn't that God said, all right, Joseph, you little sorry, low-down snowflake, I'm going to have your brothers do this to you to teach you a lesson. In Joseph's eyes, there was no cause. And Job said in his eyes, there was no, by the way, you can't tell me that in the book of Job that you ever know why God did what he allowed to happen to Job. In fact, God says just the opposite. He was a good man, upright, and shoot evil. That's what God had to say about him. God didn't say, well, I'm going to teach Job a lesson. Or Job has done something. All them three friends came in. They, they, they said that, but God didn't. God said, I have a purpose in allowing Job to be wounded. And by the way, everybody in this building has got a blessing out of it. There have been times when you needed to read the book of Job to remind yourself it's not as bad as you thought it was. But Job said in 9.17, he said, For God breaketh me with a tempest to multiply my wounds without cause. In Psalm 69.26, those whom thou hast wounded. David recognized this. He said, God, those whom thou hast wounded. In Psalms 109.22, my heart is wounded within me. But now I'm going to take you back to saying this. Watch this. Everybody here listening. The f- books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are foundational books of the Bible. Without them, you don't even understand what's going on in the rest of the Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and verse 39, God was talking to the nation of Israel, and he told them something. Listen what he said. I am God. I kill. And I make alive. I wound. And I heal. He said, you want to know what I'm like? I'm God. I can kill a man. I can make him alive. I can wound him. And I can heal him. By the way, God did just that, and he has purposes in it. When you get up to the New Testament, Acts 17, 58, what, 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 now well, we can talk a sweet, little sweet stuff all we want to and say this is what we ought to do, but honest to goodness, what allowed and enabled Stephen to tell God when they were stoning him to death, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He knew who the wounder was. There's no other explanation. It's not that he learned that in Sunday school class and said, I'm going to be a nice guy. He didn't know who was out there. He didn't know what was going to happen in the future. But there was a man standing over there that God was going to turn the world upside down. And I'm going to tell you how how powerful this is. God used a man who understood who the wounder was to reach Saul, who is going to be Paul, who wrote most of your New Testament. That's how powerful this concept is. In 2 Timothy, and I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, 2 Timothy 4.16, Paul said this. Now remember, this is Paul, who went all over establishing churches, who had Christian friends everywhere. He's coming to the close of his ministry. Guess what he says? All men forsook me. I want to tell you something. You read your Bible right, you're going to find out that Paul died a wounded man.
He said, everybody, I, all my buddies, all my friends, all my brothers, they've all forsaken me. They don't be connected with Paul. That'll get you in jail. He's the fanatic. He's the nutcase. He used to be a nice guy, but don't miss. I'm telling you, this is not, this is not a joke. Paul is sitting in prison. And he's saying, all men have forsaken me. And you, what do you, but but, but this, that's not the worst. That's not, that's not the last of the verse. Guess what the last half of that verse says? I pray that it may not be laid to their charge. He said, Lord, the people that betrayed me, that have forsaken me, that rejected me, don't want to be connected with me anymore. People that led, led the Lord, people that I minister to, people that I give the gospel to, people that, he said, the only thing to do with me, he said, Lord, don't, don't lay that to their charge because God, you've got a higher purpose. You're the one who's wounded me. You've got a reason for it. And by the way, I could preach on that one for a half hour. What's Paul saying? Same thing Stephen's saying, Job said, Joseph said, Jacob said, I know who the wounder is. And because I know who the wounder is, I don't have to be mad at people. I don't have to be angry. How can you and I honestly pray and desire for God to not lay the sin of our earthly human wounders to their charge? The only way there is, according to the Bible I know of, is by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to make us truly realize that God is the ultimate wounder. He is what, now listen to me, this is not a Bible phrase, but it is a theological phrase. It's called the primary cause. This is why people say, God, why? Because they know intuitively he is the primary cause. That if God is who he says he is, has the power he says he does, he is the primary cause behind it all. Now, this will that'll blow your mind. Now, I want to wa- wa- watch this. I'm going to clinch the nail. You, you drive the nail through the board, then you go around you. Drive it over, clinch it. I'm going to clinch the nail with you about the truth of this doctrine. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus has been falsely arrested, falsely accused, maligned, lied upon, betrayed, demonized, uh, denied, forsaken, and despised. And that's before any physical wounds. Then he is scourged, slapped, beaten, marred more than any man, spit upon, stripped naked, thorns crushed on his blessed brow, crucified and nailed to a cross, railed, mocked, and then says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What was he saying? God is the wounder. He said, I don't know if I believe that or not. Let me give you some Bible on that. The great messianic text in Isaiah 53 says this, verse 4. Surely he, Christ, hath borne our griefs. And by the way, get this verse. He has borne your griefs and he's carried your sorrows. Let him have them. Then it said this, yet we did esteem him stricken, wounded, smitten of God. Who was it that smote Jesus Christ? Was it that Roman soldier? Was it the Jews betraying him and sending them over to the Roman soldiers? No, listen to your Bible. Verse 5 says, but he was wounded, Jesus, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Watch verse 6. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Watch verse 10. The nail clinches. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Who's the wounder of the hurts and the wounds in your life? So now you've got some very serious questions to ask yourself. Am I mad at God? Is there secret deep bitterness in my heart toward God that he is the ultimate cause of my life's miseries and sorrows? And again, I ask you this question, where was Jesus wounded? The prophet said to him, he's wounded in the house of his friends. He was a Jew. In the house of Israel, the tribe of Judah. You and I will be wounded in the house of our friends. It may be in your house, your home, where you live at. It may be the church you attend, the school you go to, the work you do. 
It may be wounded by family, friends, parents, children, brothers, sisters, but it's going to be somewhere within that realm, I can just tell you. Let me tell you about America today. The United States of America will never die from the war wounds of somebody over the seas. America is being wounded in the house of its friends by its own people. The greatest threat to your freedom today is not Russia. It's not China. It's Americans. We're being wounded in the house of our friends. But you say, but Reggie, who is the ultimate wounder? Let me tell you something. God, if this nation does not repent, God will orchestrate the wounding of this country to its death. Now I'm going to get you something here. Please listen carefully. In Proverbs 27, verse 6, the Bible said, watch this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now I said that statement that faithful are the wounds of a friend. In Proverbs 18.6, it says, There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Who is he? Do you think that same friend in chapter 18 is the same friend in chapter 27 who is wounding you? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. This friend who is faithful to wound me when I need wounding. You have a friend. This morning, his name is Jesus, and he will be faithful to wound you and I. But why? Because we need healing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't get my messages just very, sometimes very easy. But I'm going to ask somebody this morning to be very kind. Brother Phil Wilson, you just sat too close. But I would like to ask if one of these boys could come and get on the operating table. Would that be all right? Would one of you boys want to be on the operating table? Do you, do you mind? You gonna be? You reckon that table holds you? If it falls, please don't. I'm not trying to wound you, okay? All right, you gonna lay down like you're gonna be operated on. Stretch out there on that table. All right, now scoot up this way a little bit. All right, now I'm gonna tell you I was studying this out, and it just so happened that my son-in-law, my favorite as of now, <laughs> had back trouble. He woke up to go deer hunting on deer season morning and couldn't even stand up. His back was so bad. And he wallowed around three or four days here and there until they finally did an MRI on him. They found out he had a bulging disc. Well, he talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, Glenn, going to have to cut on you. Glenn said, you're not doing it. Ain't nobody wounds me. Are you following me? But the pain came enough till he was ready and willing to let a guy he don't even know take a knife, put him out, and cut on him. Now, let me tell you what Jesus does. This guy here, boy, you're doing pretty good. Well, I wouldn't want to be a doctor. Mercy. I couldn't stand for a guy to look at me knowing my, his life's in my hands. I mean, but you know what? If, if, if this is you and, you're going to, and you've got an internal problem that's going to require surgery, did you know that physician is going to have to wound you first before he ever thinks about healing you? Did you know that's exactly what your great physician, Jesus Christ, says will happen? He first wounds and then he heals. And did you know what? That old boy took that knife and he operated on Glenn. It wasn't two or three. He was, next day nearly, he's walking around like, bless God Almighty, this is wonderful. I'm serious. But you know what, Glenn? That guy had to cut on you first. Now, here's the thing I want to ask you. Are you willing, are you ready for God to cut on you? Are you willing and ready for God to put a knife to you? You say, well, what's the problem? When I was going to do this and I forgot all about it. But let's just pretend you can see. God may say, you know what? We're going to have to do heart surgery on this boy. Amen. I see some anger down in there. And, buddy, if you don't get over that anger, it's going to kill you. You want me to operate on you? I didn't tell you about this dull knife I've got in my pocket. (laughs) 
But you know what? If he realizes, watch this, how much damage the anger is going to do to his life eventually, he would be tickled for God to take the knife to him. And so whenever God's wounding you, he's probably saying, we're going to operate on this now, son. It's going to be all right. You're going to be better after this over. And you're there going, and he sticks a knife in. And I tell you what, I don't know that God uses much anesthesia. But if I go in there and I cut on him, and boy, here it comes. I cut that anger out of him and sew him back up. And three years later, he gets a terrible disease. It's called greed and covetousness. And his heavenly father says, going to have to operate on you again, son. I don't want to do that. That's going to get you. You don't do something about that. It's going to kill you. And finally, okay. Let's set a surgery date. I go in there and I cut. I pull out that covetousness. Everybody understand what's going on? Now, I'm just going to, you just jump on. You did it. I'll tell you. I, Bless your heart. I love you, man. I appreciate you. They're, and poor kids, I'll tell you, they've been through a lot of surgeries here at this church, ain't you? <laughs> Can I tell you what really honestly goes on most Sunday mornings when, when the preacher's preaching? Does anybody know what's going on? Surgery? That's just the honest truth. Not all the time. Sometimes they're putting balm on the wound, but most, a lot of times the preacher preaching is surgery. Can I tell you what had to happen to you before you ever got saved? If you're sitting here today or listening to me and you've never been saved, let me tell you what's going to have to happen to you before you ever get saved. God's going to wound first before he ever heals you. He's going to have to do heart surgery on you. Salvation in and of itself is a wounding, a surgery, and a healing. And God brings that guilt and that conviction. And he wounds you with that guilt. A guy told me one time, don't put me on a guilt trip. Well, I'm going to got news for you. I will put you on a guilt trip if I can. From the word of God, not a Reggie Kelly guilt trip. But the Bible said we're all guilty before God. Amen. You'll never want surgery until you know you need it. You'll never want to be saved until you know you're a sinner, diseased in your soul, headed to hell. And if God doesn't operate on you, you're gone. Oh, God, help us to understand who the wounder is. I don't have to be mad at God. Our souls are full of diseases. I got saved January the 24th, 1982, and God's been operating on me ever since. And he ain't done. I'm going to throw, watch this one. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. His disciples are there. They've been praying. Here comes a noise, a band of soldiers with Judas at the front. Judas has said, watch this, whomsoever I kiss, that's him. Judas walks up and kisses Jesus Christ. That's how close you can be to God and die and go to hell, by the way. That's what you can be doing, by the way. You can be kissing religiously. I want to ask you, have you ever been born again? Have you truly ever been a work of the God, a work of God that a new man was birthed inside you? You repented of your sin. You came to God for mercy. You didn't come up to God and say, I'm trying to be a better person next week. Have you had that surgery? That's a work of God. That's a work of God. And you know what Jesus, what, listen to me. You know what Jesus, what did he call Judas? What do you call him? Friend. Been me, Phil. I said, you Lord, low down snake. You are a serpent. You claim to be my follower. You were with one of my disciples and look what you're doing. Terry, if I'd have been on the cross and saw Judas out there in the crowd, you sorry, worthless, low down serpent. Jesus said, friend. Why, why could he call him his friend? Because he knew that God was accomplishing his will through this person. Now, I want to tell you something. I saw the funniest thing the other day, Dean. This lady bumped into this really nice car. And the lady that was in the nice car jumped out, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Normally speaking, Phil, somebody gets hit into, banged into, they'll jump out and start cussing the driver. This lady got out, and she just cussed and kicked that car that hit her. I mean, she cussed it, kicked it up once, and the other lady just standing over. 
and she cussed and kicked that car. And then, Ralph, I saw something funnier the other day. A guy, a guy was working in carpentry, and, his, and the buddy that was working with him he hit his thumb. He was holding the nail, and he hit his thumb. Oh, I'm talking about hit his thumb in cold when you hold his thumb. And that guy grabbed the hammer out of that guy, cussed that hammer out, threw that hammer across the yard, and just kept cussing it. Never said a word to the guy that hit him. How many thinks that's ludicrous crazy? Well, I'm going to tell you that's just no more crazy than you and I cussing the people that hurt us when they're not the wounder. You and I do not, <laughs> you and I do not normally go around cussing the car that hit our car. So I'm going to tell you something. When Reggie Kelly is angry at his, quote, who he thinks is the wounders, who is he really mad at? See, we run to the what primary cause. That lady in the car, she's got more sense to know that that car just said, oh, I'm going to hit this car. She knows there is a driver behind the wheel and in the control of that car who hit that car, and she knows it's not that car's fault. It's the driver's fault. That guy with the hammer, he knows it's not the hammer's fault. He can beat that hammer to death. No, he knows it's that idiot that hit his thumb. That's who did it. You stupid. We run to the primary cause to place blame and anger at. But it's just as stupid for you and I to get mad at the people in our lives that God is wounding us with. They're just instruments. They may not mean well, they may mean, and they may hate your guts, but God still use them. Joseph's brothers hated him, but God still, I'll just tell you what, I don't care if you hate Joseph, I'll still use you through it. And that's what God wants you and I to get out of this thing. So what did Jesus call him? He called him a friend. So what have we seen in this message today? Who is it that's really wounding us? Number one, who is it? It's God. He's the wounder. Where is he, where is he wounding you? In the house of our... Who is he using to wound you? Friends. Okay. Where is he wounding you? In the house of your friends. What is he, what, why is he wounding us? Now this gets back to this operation. Why is he wounding us? Well, it could be chastening. That's, I'm just telling the truth. could be chastening, all right? Oftentimes is. But it could be to break our pride, to take our fleshliness out of us, uh, to heal us. To, to, I, I tell you what I've decided a lot of God's wounding me is, he's weaning me, Ralph, from the world. You know, we wean a set of calves. I don't tell you, those calves think the end of the world's come. Nah, nah, nah. We'll run the fence. Mommy, 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 mommy. God is weaning us, and he sends wounds in to wean us from this world. And sometimes it's to grow us, and sometimes it's to strengthen us, and sometimes it's to prepare us for ministry and to be used of him in other people's lives. And sometimes it's nothing more than to conform us to the image of Christ, because Paul said that I may know him. Watch this. And the fellowship of his sufferings. You'll never know Jesus much till you've been wounded like Jesus was wounded. And then sometimes it's to identify Christ. Sometimes it's to deepen our walk or widen our ministry. Sometimes it's for his glory. And let me say to you this morning, most of the time, you're probably never going to know this side of heaven. Job didn't know. How should we respond to our wounding, to the hate? Can we, should we just, we get hurt, we get wounded? My natural res- response is to hate people. Bitter be bitter, be vindictive. You say, my spouse hate me, so what do you do, leave? Is that the answer? No. You say, well, it's my spouse. She hurt me. He hurt me. I know. I know. I understand. I don't believe God did that. Well, that may be true, but God's going to work through it. And God being God, he could have stopped that. Yeah, but he didn't. So now the question is, what's God doing through it? What God wants to do through my, how do I react to it? You got hurt in church. What's the answer? Quit church? I want to tell you a a little secret. Put this in your pocket. You get wounded in church and leave over it, God will be waiting you at the next church. Be waiting for you. You, you, I'm just telling you. As I said a while ago, preaching often is wounding. And I think about things I've seen. I've seen people get hurt. People hurt toward me. This is important to me because I I am not out to hurt people. I'm not. It's never been, I've never got a, boy, you know, I'm going to get from preaching. I don't try to hurt them. I never, I don't even, that's not even 
I mean, remotely, foggily in my mind. But I have preached stuff that I knew was not going to set well with people. And I can remember one morning, a young lady coming into church, and I mean just whorehouse dressed, skirt up to here, and I mean just, you know, painted all up, and I mean it was all designed to make every boy in this church house full of lust. And I preached on it. And Mama got mad at me. Did it hurt her? Probably so. But is it my fault? No. I don't the one who let her dress like that and come to church. And was I out to hurt it? No. I was out to protect people who are going to be hurt. Trying to keep the wounds from going as far as it could. Been many, many situations, many situations. And people will get wounded. You get hurt. I, let me tell you something. But if she would have said, hey, God is the one wounding my heart this morning. He preached on what my daughter's doing. If my daughter's doing, if, 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 and I, by the way, I don't think I preached on that morning, but I preached, I think, oh, not too long after that. And I can see her whole countenance change that day. And from that day to this, she never looked at me with, I mean, with nothing but hate. And I'm just saying this, try to understand. I'm not giving that as a feel sorry for me. I'm telling you this is how real life works. You will get wounded in the house of your friend. If your spouse hadn't hurt you yet, you're an unusual couple. But I have to look higher. And if she would have looked higher and said, God is wounding me. God is talking. God is knocking on my door. This has to stop. This is not good. By the way, by the way, that girl, I'm not even going to go there. I just tell you the consequences of that sin. Sad. And if they were responded to the wounding and let God heal them, a bunch of other junk wouldn't have happened. The people that God is using to wound you, it may be their friend. That it really, you don't see it that way. If you get mad at God, that's not what, what we need to do is embrace the wounder. I'm going to be honest with you. You come in here on some Sunday and I preach on something, you know, and, the, and, it, and <laughs> And it wasn't very long ago, somebody said, what had you been doing? Sitting in my, literally, last week, a lady got a hold of me and said, it was like you'd been sitting in our house. Knew everything going on. Online, okay? Online. Lady said, I listened to a message, said, it's just like you've been sitting there at our house. Did I, do you think I know anything about anybody's house online? Not hardly. What I'm talking about is, is that we need to embrace the wounder. Now, here's where you make your mistake. The wounder God comes, wounds and we want God quit. We're trying to let look, get God out of the deal when the Bible teaches embrace the Lord and say to him, Lord, I will not let you go. I'm not letting go of this situation until you've touched me, until you've wounded me, to you, and I'm going to embrace the wounder and the wound. Our anger, our unforgiveness toward people that have hurt and wounded us is nothing more than projected anger and hate to God. And so I want us to learn. The Bible said this in Psalms 147, verse 3, He healeth the broken heart. And bindeth up their wounds. Let me tell you something about the wounder today. He is not wounding you to hurt you perpetually. Amen. His wounds for you are to heal you and to make you better. And if we'll ever get a hold of that, that the God is the wounder, okay? God's the wounder. He's going to use my friends. I need to embrace it. God's going to bless me by it. And God's going to heal me by it. And God's going to make my life better because of it. And if it's, even if I limp the rest of my life, it's going to be good for me. Luke chapter 10, verse 30, the Bible said there was a man wounded. Who came to him? The good Samaritan, the picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, let me say to you, yes, he will wound you, but he will heal you. If you're lost this morning, he'll wound you with conviction and wound you with guilt, but he'll heal you with grace and mercy Amen. and with the blood of Jesus. Pouring in wine and oil, amen. And he'll take you to his house. Take care of you. The great physician has had to and is cutting me open. I'm, I'm honest with you, folks. I don't feel more spiritual today than I did 30 years ago. I feel like a wretch. I see myself so much more wicked today than I ever saw myself. The more I read this book, the more I try to get in the light of God's word, the more I know God needs to operate on this man's heart. And I'm going to tell you something. He wants me to be conformed to the image of his son, and so he's going to wound Reggie and operate on Reggie and take all that junk out. As I said this morning, this, it does not absolve people that doesn't mean you just turn them over to God. God's using those people. Can I, I'm going to give you a wild one. I'll give you a wild one. How many of you ever heard of a guy named Hitler? You ever heard of Hitler? Oh, I'll tell you what, he's a sorry, slow down piece of junk. He's cursed to the earth. Can I just be honest with you? His whole, I mean, you, you from, from mean camp right on through, 
His whole goal was to kill Jews and wipe them off the face of this earth. I've got documentation. You would not believe some of the meetings those people had, how they were going to exterminate the vermin from what they called vermin from the face of this earth. Planned genocide, murder those people. But I'm going to tell you something. You, you may not like this. You may not. You say, I don't agree with you, Reggie, but just hang on. Hitler was not the Jews' wounder. God foreordained and prophesied that he was going to bring those people back into the land. And God used Hitler to start to rebirth that nation. You say, was Hitler wicked and evil? You bet he was. But even God used Hitler, the wounder of his people, to bring his people back into the land. They said, we have no place on earth to be safe. We need a land of our own. May the 5th, 1947. Just like the prophet said, in one day a nation was born. And God wounded them to heal them. Do you know what, those, you know what they said? Jesus was headed to the cross. And he, then women were weeping. He said, don't weep for me. You weep for your children. Those men said, his blood be upon us and our children. They didn't have a clue what they were saying. And all through history, God, used, God is the wounder. And God is God. Is God. And he is in control. And you and I need to embrace that. And when you get hurt, embrace it. Now, the rest of the story about Walter Dixon. Remember him about three hours ago? I'll tell you this and we'll go home. Came back, meets his wife. She's married with a child. I know, man, 28 months have passed since he's supposed to been dead. What do you think Walter Dixon did, Joel? You have no clue, right? <laughs> I want to ask you a question. What would you have done had you been Walter Dixon? Went and fought for your country, prisoner of war, 28 months in a hell hole. You get out and your wife, you know, they, they put you down as killed in action. Your sweetheart, whom you dreamed about and lived for just to see her when you got back, she's married to another guy, Dennis, and got a child by him. Life's been real sweet to him, hasn't it? Life's been really good to Walter. You know what Walter did? You, you, you need to watch this clip. It's on my Facebook feed. It's on, it's on a clip. He, he said, I said, well, and I won't say the word, just to be nice. And then he said, I really didn't even use that word. It was a worse word, but I won't say it. And he said, I walked off the porch. A little time went on, and he was in the town where he was grew up in, Essex, and he met the girl who worked for the newspaper who wrote his obituary. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a sweet meeting? Oh, you're Walter? I wrote your obituary. She worked for the newspaper that wrote his obituary. She wrote his obituary. I mean, literally, she wrote it and put it, and that was her job. He said, you wrote my obituary? She said, yeah. He said, well, you did a pretty good job of it. He said, how'd you like to go out sometime? And he took her out on a date, and they got married. 61 years they were married, three kids. Every five years they renewed their wedding vows. Walter lives up here toward Fort Linden Wood right now today. Every day of his life, he says, I get in my old truck, which I'm very happy with. It is paid for. And I drive the old country roads up here in LeCleague County and whatever that county is up there. And he said, I just tell myself every day how good God is and how good God's been to me. And he said this. I, I listened to him say it. And when he said it, I tell you, conviction smoked me. He said, if you're living one day of your life, listen to me, if you're living one day of your life without enjoying it, you're not right. You're messed up. You know what he said? I'm not letting 28 months in a hellhole in Korea, for whatever purposes God allowed that, keep me from living a fulfilled life. Keep the joy out of my heart. I'm not letting the fact that my wife, I can't blame her. She thought I was dead. What would you do as a pastor to tell that guy? Huh? Yeah, fix that one for me. Amen? <laughs> marry or to not marry. And I'm not letting the fact that my sweetheart, whose letters I had in my jacket, when I put it on my dead buddy's body, 
married another man. You listen to me. His thoughts of her lying in the arms of another man while he was in prison of war is not an easy thought for a man to think about. Walter said, I can't do anything about all that past. But I'm not going to let it ruin my future. I'm going to get in my truck every day. He's 90 years old today. His wife died two years ago. They interviewed him. He said, he said boy, she, is a, she, was a, she was a dandy. She's an awful lucky woman, too, being married to me. <laughs> he had a sense of humor at 90 years old. I want to ask you, what are you going to do with your wounders today? Are you going to be mad the rest of your life? You're going to hate them until you until they throw the last piece of dirt over your casket? Or this morning, would you, if you don't want it, this message, would you pray for me? That I'd understand who the wounder really is? That's not the people that hurt me, that wounded me, that lied on me, that betrayed me, that did this and did that. That my Heavenly Father has some kind of an ultimate purpose in everything and everybody that's going on. And I invite you this morning... I'm going to give an invitation, Joel, if you'll come. I'm going to give an invitation. You listen to me. I'm going to invite you in this church. I'm going to come to this front of this church somewhere and get on your knees and say, Dear God in heaven, I'm going to recognize today that you are the wounder. And, Lord, I am no longer by your grace. If you'll give me grace, God, I will not be mad or angry or bitter at the people who hurt me. And I'm not going to be mad at you. And I'm going to embrace you. And I'm going to embrace the wounds. And I'm going to reach down in my soul and believe with all my heart that you have an ultimate purpose in allowing this to happen. And I don't even know what it is. And Lord, if I never understand this side of eternity, I will bless your holy name. Let's stand together. Let's come. You want to come and talk to God this morning and say, God, I recognize today that it's you are the wounder. It's not that person. And I want to embrace the wounder today. And I want to embrace the wound Why don't you come? Listen, I wouldn't fight the Holy Ghost three seconds. If you're back there today and you say, Reggie, I'm afraid I'll come and then I'll, hey, join the crowd. But a thousand times if I have to say, God, I recognize you're the wounder, not not me. Would you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you let God give you a victory in this area of your life?